joining us today for the worship service at Calvary Road Baptist Church. Our desire is to equip believers to become fully devoted followers of Christ. Calvary Road has a dynamic ministry committed to worshiping God, loving others, serving others, and inviting others. But uh, we're glad you're here tonight. If you would stand and let's sing this first. <laughs> that you're here tonight and trust that you've come for no other purpose but to lift up the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because He is worthy. Amen. Amen. It's good to know that He's on the throne, He's in control, and we look to Him for hope and for help. Amen. And so it's good to know that He knows exactly who we are and where we are, and it's just good for us to be in God's house tonight. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank You for loving us the way You do. Thank you for the privilege to be here tonight. And I pray, God, that as we continue in a time of worship, God, that our voices would be pleasing unto you as we sing from our hearts, God, uh, in response to what you have done for us, God. I, uh, even just a song isn't enough, God. It's, it's great for us to sing, but God, I pray that that song would also be evidenced in each one of our lives as we seek to live out our life in such a way that would bring honor and glory to your name. We love you and are so very thankful for all that you've done. And I pray, God, that as we have a time to sit together tonight and study your word, I pray that you would speak to us through your servant tonight. We pray for our pastor that you would hide him behind the cross and allow him to preach with boldness what we desperately need to hear, and that is a word from you. So, God, do what only you can do tonight in the lives of your people. We pray all this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.
As the choir comes down, let's stand and sing, I am thine, O Lord. I am thine. Church, I uh, had a brief giving opportunity for you. Uh, Haywood Christian Ministries has brought us a, uh, an angel tree, a giving tree, uh, for some kids in Haywood County. Uh, I think there's around 20 tags uh, on a tree back here next to the water fountains uh, near the fireplace. So if you're interested in doing that, uh, the tags have all the information you need as far as um, wants and needs of each, uh, each child. Uh, don't wrap the gifts. Um, Haywood Christian Ministry wants to go through everything um, that is bought just to make sure that they're appropriate um, and that it's what uh, the children desire. Um, yes? Okay. Jeff also has a tag at his shop. If uh, We run out of tags back here, and if you're wanting to do it, um, you can go by a shop. Or when are they due, Jeff, your tags? December 12th. Okay. These are due December 13th, which is next Thursday. Um, <laughs> and so uh, don't wrap your presents. Um, like I said, Heavy Christian Ministry wants to go through all of them, make sure everybody gets what they want and uh, gifts are appropriate. Take your gifts to, uh, directly to Haywood Christian Ministry. Uh, it cuts out a middleman. Uh, make sure every, all the gifts are taken to the appropriate places. Just make sure that the tag of your child or your particular child or children is with the gifts uh, with their gifts uh, and Haywood Christian Ministries they'll take those in uh, they'll sort them and they'll give them to the parents um, again this is all uh, due Thursday maybe the 12th Thursday the 12th uh, I thought she told me the 13th but it's the 12th um, so have them there. Uh, Haywood Christian Ministries, if you don't know where it's at, is located on 150 Brainerd Avenue. It's right across the road from the big parking garage uh, right in the middle of uh, downtown Waynesville. Okay? All right. I'm going to try something tonight, and uh, 
My mom and I was talking today and was reminded that uh, two years ago today, my Uncle Ronnie died and set off of a real chain of events in our family. And she and I was talking about how you can't believe two years is, of time has already passed. And to them in heaven, it's probably been more like a second maybe. And, uh, you know, I can't wait for heaven. I carry this old song in my Bible. The problem is I can't see it as well as I used to. And that's okay because we just sung a whole song in a choir without any words. Uh, so if this begins to sound unusual, it just fits right in with the way we do things. Take your Bibles, be turning to the book of 1 Samuel if you would, book of 1 Samuel. I'm glad to see you tonight, I hope you're doing well, and uh, I hope you've had a good day, hope you've had a good week, 
and it's so good to be back in God's house on uh, Wednesday night, man. It just does something for us. I've always loved Wednesday night. I think people that choose to just not do it have missed a tremendous blessing. Wednesday nights is probably my funnest time to teach and spend time with you guys. It's laid back and uh, uh, we, we're just, I don't know what it is. We shouldn't be so formal on Sunday mornings, but we are. Um, and then after Sunday morning, man, we eliminate most of that crowd that uh, don't want to be back. So you get the ones back on Wednesday generally that really want to be here. And, uh, and I appreciate that. I really love you and appreciate you. Somebody asked me one time, why do you all conduct your business on Wednesday night? And I say, because that's when the church is here. That's when the people that is the backbone of the church, the people that's going to support the church, the givers of the church for the most part, givers of time and talent, that's when they're here. And uh, that's a shame, but it's true, isn't it? So tonight we're going to, uh, we're going to vote on about $3 million worth, so y'all just hang on and just let the Sunday morning people know about it and tell them uh, they should have been here. We're not either, so that just scared somebody to death in here, but... I like to do that every chance I get. When we uh, look through the life of Samuel, what a godly man. And then I stop to think about this, a godly man living in some very ungodly times. Do you ever feel like we're outnumbered? Do you ever start getting the feeling that we are more outnumbered now than we've ever been. And by that I mean God-fearing, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving people who really believe His Word. They are few and far between. And it would seem by all of the fake news that we do get that we really don't exist anymore. But that's not true. When we come to church, we're encouraged by the fact we're not alone. Now, the numbers, I don't think, are what they need to be. And the numbers are not what they used to be, but we are not alone. We are not alone in this walk that we're in and the journey that we're in, that God has a plan for us. If God was done with us, we wouldn't be here tonight. He had already come and got his church. I am afraid the fact is not that God is done with us, I'm afraid a lot of the church has given up on God. I'm afraid that a lot of churches have given up on revival, given up on hope, given up on seeing God move. Do we still believe in the miracles? Now, we've journeyed with Samuel for quite a ways. And if you remember, we are now up to the point that Saul is king. Samuel is trying to direct the king because Samuel is the man carrying the word from God. And as he carries a word from God, he is to deliver that to the king. The king is to obey God. We saw that a couple of uh, or several messages ago where the fact was it's uh, the Lord that made Saul king. By the way, you know, we need to just be reminded tonight, if you're here, it's because God lets you be. You're really not that special. Um, you, you don't really, life could continue to exist without us. I know that seems hard to believe sometimes, but it really could. If you think about it, how many people have you known have died and gone on, but life has carried on? The stock market will not fail tomorrow because you're not in it. Life will move on. We get to be here tonight because God led us. We get to serve him because it's an honor to serve him. It's a joy to serve him, but you don't have to. Nobody's holding you down, forcing you to. You don't have to love God. You don't have to be a part of anything God is doing. You don't have to be in church. You don't have to do anything like that. God gave you free choice. God gave you a will to do whatever you choose to do. Now, you can choose life or you can choose death. You can choose blessing or you can choose burdens. You can do that on your own. That's completely up to you. What I love about it is I genuinely believe there's still people who are doing what they're doing because they genuinely love God. Samuel loved God. Saul was doing what he did in the beginning with some good intention, but it doesn't take him very long as king to go down the wrong road. He goes down the wrong road in a hurry. 
And so we saw in verse 1 that there was three elements that Samuel laid out to Saul. First, that God made you king. Second, you need to submit to the prophet. Submit to the man that God has put in place to spiritually lead. And then thirdly, your kingship, and you need to understand, the people over whom you reign are God's people. They don't belong to you. They are God's people. Those were the three elements of verse 1. I want you to call that, if you would, maybe kind of scene one. That's if we're looking at the movie, that's what's going on, and there's been a word. And then the next word comes to, to the king that says this, you are to go and take care of the Amalekites. God wants to inflict his judgment on the Amalekites. It is your job to go in and destroy everything. Do not leave anything alive. Do not leave anything up on its feet. Don't do that. And I saw with you the last time, this sounds like a horrible moment. And it really is. The sounds of the words of God to the ears of Saul must have sounded terrible. But I can tell you this. He maketh no mistakes. God knows what he's doing. God had a plan for his people. And when we look in the Old Testament, he was setting the tone for his people. They were to not allow anything to enter into their camp that was not of him. They were to remain, remain pure. They were to remain whole. They were to remain clean. So I want to say tonight, our God is not changed. We now are his people. We are a New Testament church. We follow the, the Bible. We belong to the king. And the king tells us, gives us orders. We are to remain pure, even in an impure society. We are to remain uh, whole. We are to stay with God's word no matter what's going on around us. No matter the noise around us, you and I are to remain true and holy. And we are to remain pure in our walk with God. So when we look in these episodes, it's a great reminder that God doesn't go back on his word. Listen, you need to understand tonight, along with me, whatever God said in his word, he meant it. And he's not going to change his mind because you don't take him serious or I don't take him serious. He's not going to change his mind because a Supreme Court's decided they don't think that that's right and they'll go a different direction. He's not going to change his mind because Congress has a different idea. God's not going to change. They're not going to overthrow God. They're not going to overrule God. There's no Baptist church can overrule God. You can't vote him out in a business meeting. You can't do away with him. You can't impeach God. He's, he's God. He's the one in charge. You can't go up to him and say you no longer rule. He's always going to rule. Doesn't matter what the atheist thinks or says. It doesn't matter what the person who's mad at God says. It doesn't matter what the person who is irreverent and disrespectful of God says. He's God. And he's going to stay with his word no matter what. You can rely on the promises of God. Well, uh, hopefully this Sunday and probably the Wednesday nights to follow. It's kind of weird for us at Calvary Road. We're going to have a normal December. We've never had much of a normal December since I've been with you, but we don't have a lot going on. We're just going to have church. And I'm going to start a series on Sunday about Christmas that I've gone titled, Does It Really Matter? Does It Really Matter? And I want to just set the tone tonight because we're going to talk about some things. Does it really matter? Because I wonder anymore uh, the way we act, not just us, but I'm talking about Christianity in general acts as if it doesn't matter. Most everybody will be in here Sunday morning can about quote you the, the, the birth of Jesus. They can about quote Luke 2. I was watching some of the country music special last night. Found it fascinating how they sung song after song about the birth of Jesus. They mentioned his name several times. They sung those hymns several times. Even in the end there was a song sung about his crucifixion. He was God's child. And the people applauded, and they were teared up. There was a great applause at the end after that that was sung. People seemingly, here's what's fascinating, most people, even in the world, are not turned off to the Luke 2 passage of who Jesus is. They talk about it. They, they see this, the manger scenes. Now, there's been an attack, and we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. It ties right in with the message. But the question is, is if your children and grandchildren approached you and said, 
Why Bethlehem? Can you answer them? What was so significant about Bethlehem? You know the story. Where was Jesus born? He's born in Bethlehem. So, so what? Why does Bethlehem matter? What about a virgin birth? Does that even matter? And, and here's the big one. Why did God become man? Could he not have redeemed us any other way? Can we answer that? I mean, when we read the story, what about the details? Why shepherds? Why would he even talk to the shepherds? What was it about a star? What is it about all of those things? Do you think that it just became something that happened, that suddenly they remembered, oh, it was Bethlehem? Not really significant. Oh, yes, it is. It was very significant. And so when we unfold Scripture, we start seeing God does not make any mistakes. God had this whole thing mapped out, planned out. Everything was laid out just exactly. Have you ever given this much thought? Why Joseph? Or why Mary? What was it about them? Was Joseph even that significant? You ever given much thought about the very Christmas stories that we read? And I get back in these Old Testament passages, and a lot of people say this, the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore. Now the newfangled thing of the church, the new direction of our day church is this, that they don't even refer to the Old Testament anymore. It's an antiquated story. It doesn't need to be referred to. It's too bloody. The God of the Old Testament we don't even need to look at. That stuff is stuff of the past. I'm going to tell you something tonight. We can see the Lord Jesus from the very beginning of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, they created. God the Father, we heard this Sunday. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all on scene when you and I and mankind came into existence. In Genesis 3, we see how it's all going to end too. We see the very battle that will happen on Calvary in the third chapter of Genesis. It all matters. It is a big deal. And a lot of people sitting in the church have no idea what they even believe. They read it. They buy cards that say it and they don't even know how to answer the very common questions of does it really matter anymore it does matter does God's word matter that's the question of tonight it begins tonight in our little passage in Samuel it's going to carry on over into Sunday does the things of God matter or was it just stuff that the gospel writers just threw in there about his birth or did it really matter did it really matter that he was born in a manger? How come there couldn't have been one room for him in the end? Do you think God didn't know there would be no rooms in the end? Why would they have been led there for such a time as that? Does it really matter? It does matter. Did it matter what God said to Saul through the prophet? Don't leave anything alive. Does it matter? Let me ask you something, church. Is God in the details? Does it matter? Do you think Sunday the vote we took, does it matter? Or should we just get any music guy? Does it matter who it is? Or did God hand pick us out the next guy? Did God put his hand on the next guy? Was he God-led, God-driven? Is that what we were voting on? That's what I cast my vote on. It wasn't Dan the man. It was Dan God's man who God wanted here. Does it matter? The, do the details matter about what God is doing on an everyday ma basis? Details do matter. And you know what? He told him the details, and Saul did not agree to the details. he done his own thing. And we drop down to verse 10 and 11, and we read this. Then came the word of the Lord to Samuel. When Saul did not fully obey God, when he didn't do everything God said, then came the Lord, word of the Lord to, to Samuel. And let me tell you something, church. I hope and pray you and I as a church never get to this place. That we get to a place that we hear a word from God that is a word we didn't want to hear. Then came the word of the Lord saying, I regret I ever chose it. I regret, look at, look at this, verse 11. It repenteth me. The word truly means regret. Here's, here's the real meaning of the word. I'm sorry that I ever made Saul king. I gave him a chance. He made his own choices. I'm sorry that I ever made. Literally, he did not 
fulfill my words. I'm going to tell you something, Calvary Road. We have a very brief period of time. Jesus is coming again. Our time is short. You can say, I've been hearing Jesus is coming my whole life. Well, that's true, and it is still true. But I can tell you this too. You don't have as much as a life left as you did then either. When you first heard Jesus was coming, was a lot, a long time ago maybe. Guess what? You don't have a lot of time left. We don't have a lot of time left as a church. I don't have many sermons left in me. I may have less sermons left than I've already preached. I may have less time to pastor a church left than I've already had. You probably, I probably, I don't know. I know by looking around at the average age in this room, we probably have less time left than we've already lived. Have you considered that? So we only get one shot at this. We only get to do what God's telling us to do, leading us as a church to do. The time is short. And God is saying, Calvary Road, I've given you an open window. I've given you an open door. I've thrown open the windows for you to do some things for me. Now, you can sit there like it don't matter, or you can choose to do it. If you don't do it, you're going to be judged because of it. Judgment will surely come. Look in verse 11. It repenteth me that I've set up Saul to be king. Watch this. For he's turned back from following me. He's not performed my commandments. How many of you, if you were to die tonight, would hear those words? You have not performed the commandments of God. You think God gifted you for you just to sit You think God saved us for us just to take up a seat in the church, to hear messages, hear songs, and then go back to our job and just live our life as normal? Come back when we have occasion to, hear another message, hear a few more songs, and not respond to the commands of God? A command of God is this, that we're to go out and lead people to Him. We've been commanded by God to do that. How many of you have led anybody to the Lord Jesus? I'm not, I I hope you have. I'm not, I'm not answering that for you. I'm asking if we were to leave this planet tonight and stand before the same God who said this about Saul, what would be said of us? You turned back from following me. You didn't wholeheartedly throw your life into it. And then I want to show you something that I want to stick with tonight. This is the theme of tonight for a few minutes. It's the last part of verse 11. Our text, what our series has been dealing with for the most part is Samuel. When Samuel heard this out of God's mouth, this is what happened. Verse 11, and it grieved Samuel. And he cried to the Lord all night. I wrote this in my notes. Maybe that's what's missing today. We don't weep over our sin. How many of us lay down at night truly bothered by the fact that we've not truly followed the commands of God? God told us to love our neighbor as ourself, do we? God told us to forgive people. Forgive others as I have forgiven you. Have we? God told us if we have iniquity in our heart that he don't even hear our cry. That we have to get that out of our life. Have we? Well, I bet tonight even in this small a gathering that there are people sitting in this room that still have resentment against somebody. Harbor deep-seated feelings. And God's command is don't live like that. But here's the question. How come it is we don't lay awake all night crying about what's happening? Let let me read a few just in the last little bit. School district forces females 
to share the locker room with biological males who identify as girls. A school district in Illinois has voted to allow biological males who identify as unrestrict or as girls unrestricted access to the female locker room. One student, I'm reading this from, from where it come out of, one student in tears telling reporters she felt uncomfortable, her privacy's being invaded, I am a swimmer. I changed multiple times, fully unclothed in front of other students in the locker room. And this school board sat down and decided that if a male says, I identify as a female, he has unlimited access to the locker room anytime he wants. Robin Williams, of all people to quote, this is what he said one time. Words and ideas can change the world. You know what I'm afraid of, church? Words and ideas are changing the world. And the church is doing nothing. The church just sits silently while words and ideas are changing the culture we live in. You know what's going to happen to us? The freedom to do what we're doing is going to be taken away from us. These Wednesday night comfortable settings are going to be snatched away. You better believe tonight the war is on in this country. You and I better believe that it's far, far past taking prayer out of schools. When we took prayer out of schools, this is where we was headed. This is the direction we were headed. And now, unlimited access. So what do you do now? I mean, what is at stake? It'd be good for us to remember what is at stake. Abortion worldwide has ended more than 1 billion, 555 million, 600,000 lives. If a disease tonight killed even a fraction of that numbers, this world would be working without sleep to prevent that disease from killing anybody else. But now it's sociably acceptable. You want to know what's next? euthanasia you all know where we're headed and I want to know this when we hear these headlines why don't we wet the pillow at night saying God what's wrong with us why don't why are our Sunday services filled the seats but the altar remains empty who are we waiting on before we break down and get on our face and say God my grandbaby's coming up in this culture. My youngins are never going to see the days like I saw. And guess what? They're not. Can you imagine this when you were in school? Can you imagine a young man saying, I identify as a girl today. I'm going to walk into that locker room and there's not a thing you can say to me or do to me. Can you imagine that? But that's what's happening now. And, and we're just at the tip of the iceberg. The real question is, is do we care enough to say, God, we believe you're still miracle working God. And Lord God, we need you. Standing for biblical morality is a spiritual battle. And guess what, church? It has life and death consequences to it. And the very stake of what we're doing in here tonight is on us. This is on us. It's our prayer warriors. We've got to step up to the plate and be prayer warriors. If not, we ought to hug our youngins and say good luck to you because now the very gates of hell have been opened to this country, but we just don't have the time to be bothered by it. We only wanted to fill the pew. We don't have any investment in this. We didn't have time to think about it because we had other places to be and other things to do. 
And I'm telling you, real God-fearing churches ought to be wetting the altars with their tears. The difference in Samuel and the difference in most of today and most preachers today is there's not a tear streams off their cheek when they hear God say, I'm telling you, I'm sorry that I ever made this thing happen. You all have disobeyed my commandments and now I've got to unleash my wrath. And it is coming. How can we hold these little innocent children and not want to do everything in our power to reach them? Before we become too discouraged, listen to this. I want you to hear this. Christianity is not first and foremost about establishing righteousness or creating good values or securing justice or making peace. I know what we're at war with tonight. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Don't get me wrong. Those are good things when we stand and hold up signs about abortion. When we stand up for what we believe in. Those are good things. But for Christians, it's secondary to the primary good of God himself. And our task is to worship him and to honor him in everything that we do. We've got to honor God with our lives and live our lives with passion for Jesus Christ. We can't fake God out. And just because we're sitting in church, we have not got God deceived tonight. We don't have him duped. He knows us. He knows what we really are. He knows what we really think. He knows how we're really living. He knows what's on our phones. He knows what's on our computers. He knows what we've been looking at, what we've been reading, what we're thinking. There's not a motel room he's not peered into. There's not a deep, dark alley he's not been in. There's nowhere God's not. Even David himself said, if I make my bed and show you're there, if I send to the uttermost part, you are there. God is everywhere. Our foremost calling is to worship him and honor him with everything we have. It'll make a difference in our society if we will. I truly believe that. I just want to call to your attention tonight, does it matter? Does this whole thing matter about getting in our Bible and finding out who God is and worshiping God with our whole heart? Does it matter raising our kids in the Word? Does it matter anymore? Charleston, West Virginia has held an old-fashioned downtown Christmas parade for many years. In early October, the city's official Facebook page announced this. The Charleston Winter Parade will begin at the corner of something Boulevard, I can't even pronounce it, and Capitol Street. See, their recently elected mayor, one of the first things I wanted to do was change the name of the Christmas parade to a winter parade. But thank God not many citizens saw that decision as a good one. The outcry forced the mayor to change it back. But Starbucks, uh uh-oh, don't say that in church because we love them. Here are two examples. Starbucks now give coffee cups that say Merry Coffee. And we wish you a Merry Coffee. But a Starbucks spokesman noted that we do still offer a Christmas blend and that their stores will be decorated during the holidays with Christmas colors and candy cane ribbon. You say, well, that ain't that big a deal. At least they still have the Christmas blend. But is that really what you want to carry around on a daily basis is merry coffee? We're talking about God becoming flesh. Dying for us. Christmas. But here's the problem. Once they convince us, society, secular society, once they convince us that truth is what we believe it to be, the way is clear to rename and redefine those religious beliefs and practices that they find objectionable. And that's what they're doing in America. John Adams wisely noted, facts are stubborn things. He's right. 
It has been a steady parade in America for the last several years of taking Jesus out of everything. Taking his name out of as many possible things as they can take his name out of. And tonight, they are trying to convince us of what truth is. And little by little, they have pecked away even inside the church. And in the hometown that I've grown up in, sweet little Waynesville, that I love with all my heart, was, was born here, raised here, pastor a church in, in Haywood County. I love Waynesville. But I'm going to tell you what, you drive into Waynesville now and visit churches, and you will struggle to find in a lot of churches what they even believe. You will struggle to find truth being sounded forth from the pulpit. You will struggle. You know what they're doing? They're doing away with Scripture, and they're trying to rewrite right truth. And they're trying to tell people what truth is subjective. It's just what you make it out to be. And I'm telling you, they're convincing the next generation of that. They're, con they're convincing our young people that. They're convincing our young ones of that. They start them out at a very young age telling them that it's completely normal for male to be with male, female to be with female. They tell them that at their little schools. You send them home and mom and dad plops down in the chair and watches shows that that's very prominent on Male and male. You can't even see a Christmas commercial now on television that doesn't have one locked up with another one. You can't even watch a Christmas card commercial now that they don't and put it in every commercial. Why? Well, maybe you're going to believe what you're going to believe, but you better believe this. They're not after you as much as they're after them little eyes and those little ears who are sitting there watching that. And they want to put a new truth inside their ears. And they want to put a new truth in the vision of their eyes to where they'll stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with us one day, our very children and grandchildren, and say, you're wrong. You're wrong. That's not how it is. And I know I, I probably go right to the top. This stuff goes out online. I realize that it'll go out on the radio. Everybody identifies who it is. Um, and, and I understand that. And I'm willing to stick my neck out there. I'm willing to stick my, put my big mouth out there. If you're willing to back me because I do. And if you're not willing, you need to go to one of those wishy-washy, mamby-pamby, little freaked out churches and join up with them. Go on, do whatever you want to do. But as for me and my house and this house, we want to serve the Lord and stand on the Word of God. If it scares you to be a part of that, then move on. Because that's a problem today. Everybody's scared to make a stand. We need Samuels who will stand up to even kings and say, you got it wrong. Now, there's a way to do that. We still need to be loving in how we do that. But I save the best for last. America has a presidential candidate right now. It's the first openly gay one we've ever had. And if you look, he's leading New Hampshire. He's rising in the polls. You and I never thought we'd see that. And I don't have hate. Listen, this is not hate. This is not hate. I, I'm as against an adulterer doing it, uh, running for office. We ought to be just as against sin, all sin. This is not hate about a group. I hope you hear that. What I'm trying to show you tonight is because the church has set yawning in the pews, paying no attention to what's going on. We're losing our country. We're losing what it stood for. We're losing the church. We're losing the fabric of the United States of America. And it's being handed over into godless hands. And you know the only result of that is the wrath of God. And I don't know about you, but I got two youngins that I love who I want to see them in marriages, being blessed by God, living in a God-blessed country, and raising my grandchildren in a God-blessed country. But if something don't turn, they're going to be trying to raise children and be married in a country that God has said, I regret that I ever allowed this and my wrath is going to be poured out and God forbid that we sit in the church like it don't matter. It does matter. 
I don't care what age we're at. You may say, well, I'm almost gone anyway. Well, I'm going to tell you, you're the one that ought to be leading the church first and foremost. Help us to see the way. But we know because of that now, our society's changed. In 2004, 60% of Americans opposed same-sex marriage while only 31% were in favor. 2004. Did you know today, 2019, 15 years later, the numbers are completely reversed. Only 32% believe it's wrong. It's reversed. A study was done in 32% of non-evangelical Americans. 32% of non-evangelical Americans have, listen to this, have warm feelings toward white evangelical Christians. Now pause just a minute while I look around. That's you. They have warm, only 32% of non-evangelicals living in America have warm feelings about us. Listen to what they're saying. You all and myself, we're the problem. And the problem must be dealt with. A recent study, a recent essay in the Wall Street Journal notes that 44% of Americans aged 18 to 29, let's just see if television, if radio and news has done its job. You want to put it to the test? 44% of Americans aged 18 to 29 say they identify with no religion. Do you know we're closing in on half of our 18 to 29-year-olds? They identify with no religion whatsoever. You want to know why? Here's their reason. They don't like the positions churches take on political and social issues. A college professor adds that some of the issues his students object to most often have to do with women's reproductive rights. Now that's a fancy word of, of abortion. And non-heteronormative sexuality. Same-sex marriage and transgender rights. A group of clergy recently gathered and prayed for God to bless a Planned Parenthood abortion clinic. So you drive into a town and you don't know anything about God and your plan is, is to find out who God is and what God is about. So you start visiting different churches in any small town America, any town of America. You walk in a church and they'll tell you God is good with it. You go into another church and they'll say God forbids it. God says in his word that it is forbidden. They drive to the next church and that church says God is good with it. Pay no attention to what the other churches are telling you. They're hate mongers. They're spewing hate. They walk into another church and the preacher says, with all the love in his heart, I love you too much to see you die without Jesus. But the Bible is clear on this. God said he forbids marriage of male to male and female to female. God says he knew you before you were even formed in your mother's womb. And life begins at conception. Life does not begin the moment you're born. Life begins when it all happens at reproduction, when it happens and, and that sail burst forth. You became life. You became life. They go to the next church and they say, no, that is not true. That is not true. No wonder there's so much confusion. No wonder. Kids were raised in church and told what the Bible says. Sent off into secular universities with a godless professor who tells them something completely opposite and they, they swallow a lot of it. A lot of kids are only taken to church when it was convenient for mom and dad to go to church. As long as something else didn't get in the way. Surely the goodness travel ball cannot get in the way of church, man. We can't let camping get in the way of it. We can't let vacations get in the way of it. So we just took our children when it was convenient. But let me tell you, they have to show up to that college class. And when they show up, that man has one agenda. I am going to tell you, I'm going to tell you everything you 
you've been raised in is wrong, let me give you a true picture of it. And so what's happened in the local church? Well, you can't draw crowds preaching like I preach tonight. You just, you won't draw numbers doing that because John Swanger and Calvary Road is hate field. I have a different description of it. I call it truth. It's not hate. And I hope anyone who would hear this message would understand. The only reason I would say this is your only hope for life in eternity with God is to turn and repent of your sin and run to Jesus. And nothing you have done and no place you have been is too wrong that He won't forgive you of it. God will forgive you of every sin you've ever committed. We're all sinners. We all stand in need of the forgiveness of God. I'm talking to the church tonight about the fact that if we don't wake up and realize that it matters, we're going to lose our young people and our next church. And Calvary Road will be an empty building. So here's what a lot of churches decided to do. Our next pastor is a guy that's got to come in and not preach like that. What you're hearing tonight. No, sir. That is not what we're looking for. If I bring friends into church, I don't want them to be offended. I don't want them to be uncomfortable. So what they'll do is exactly what Paul said they'd do. Timothy, they will bring men in. They will heap unto them those teachers that will only tell them what they want to hear because they have itching ears. And so we get little Barney messages. We get, I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. And God's all about it. And you just do what you want to do. And it's only wrong if you see it as wrong. It's all subjective. Don't worry about it. And the teachers to whom Paul refers, they are inside the church. While I stand here tonight, most of America's church's pulpits are filled with men tickling the ears of the listeners on the pews. They're job scared. They're scared they're going to get jerked into a room to the side and be told by some board of directors that they can't do that or say those things. And let me tell you, it happened to me a few years ago. I preached in a church that the pastor drove to my house and told me, I can never have you back again. Which I in turn told him, if I was you, I would never go back again. I believe some of these preachers, now stay with me, I do agree with this. I think some of them are well-intentioned. They might believe personally that the unbiblical message they propagate, they really might believe what they're saying. But you can be sincere and still be wrong. I believe they're wanting to connect with non-Christians. I think we ought to connect with non-Christians. But I don't think at the sacrifice of our integrity or who we are as God's children. And I don't think we need to sit down at a bar and have beer and Bible study to reach non-Christians. I think I can love on a man out there who might be an alcoholic. I can love him without drinking myself. I think I can stand next to the homosexual. I truly believe this. And he may disagree with me. But when I walk off from that, I really want him to know I still love you, man. I love you from the depths of my heart. God loves you so much he gave his only son. Here's the problem, though. Those men who might personally believe this message or this propaganda, here's the scary part. They are turning away the people from the truth. And what happens is they wander off into myths. So Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready. Be instant in season and out of season. And here's the words he gives him. When you stand, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And, and he said, be patient in that. Keep teaching him. Uh, reprove means to speak to the mind. Rebuke is to address the conscience. To exhort is to encourage the will. That's what we're trying to do tonight. I'm trying to tell you tonight, part of this is reproof. When I saw Samuel crying all night long over Saul, I thought about this and it convicted me. When's the last time I wept over wrong? 
When is the last time it bothered me? I'm afraid we have worked calluses onto our hearts. And I'm afraid that your grandpas and grandmas and our great grandmas and our great grandpas would walk into our society and look around. And you know what they'd do if they attended one of our church services? They wouldn't wait till the invitation after the message. I believe they'd bury up in our prayer rooms and our closets and they'd start crying out to God, what has happened to the nation that we once loved? What's happened to the families? What's happened to these kids? What's happened to this place? Oh God, would you once again send your power and help us because it looks like they're too far gone God to help us but did you know a lot of men can stand now and preach a message like this and people get in the car and say what is he mad about or why is he so upset why do you have to preach like that listen I'm preaching to myself where is my tears does it matter? Was you here Sunday night? Did you see this stage packed with little ones? Did you see the choir filled with those little young ones? And then I'll ask you, does it matter? Do we just turn them loose to the hounds of hell? Do we just turn them loose to godless secular teaching? Do we? Will you teach them in your home? Will you sit them down and show them what it's all about? Because let me tell you what, guys, it ain't going to happen any other way. you got to do it. And it's got to happen more than just on Sunday morning here. For goodness sake, when I'm up here on Sunday morning, I know your kids ain't getting much because they go to the bathroom nine times. I'm telling the honest truth. I told my mama one time I was going to the bathroom again. One time. I tell you what, take them to Dollywood Riding Rides, they won't go once in four hours. The devil don't want this stuff coming into their ears and in their minds. Nothing is insignificant. Nothing. I hope we'll remember the words of Paul. As he said this in 2 Timothy 4, I charge you in the presence of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead. What it may cost us in this world to serve God pales in comparison to what it will cost us in the next world if we do not. And what it will cost those we influence as well. I want to read that again to you. What it may cost us in this world to serve God pales in comparison to what it will cost us in the next world if we do not. I have family tonight that was raised in church and a good bit of them are not in church anymore. I have a sweet little baby in my family right now that without a big turn Without something major, I don't know how often she'll ever go to church. When I stood over my dad's casket in here, I looked down at my family. I had an overwhelming thought that I gave them. And I said, the one thing I'm so proud of about my daddy is he gave me a chance to be saved. He took me to church. He let me hear about Jesus and gave me an opportunity to be saved. I want to ask you something. Parents, grandparents, let this set in for a second tonight. I'm asking you to bear with me tonight. But let this set in. I want you to think about heaven without your grandchild. Think about heaven without your child. And I ask you, is it important? Does it matter? Does it matter we know what we believe? Does it matter? Man, I'm telling you what. You look in the face of these innocent youngins and consider the fact of them spending eternity separated forever from God where the Bible says it's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth 
where the fire is never quenched. That's the biblical description of hell. We read that about hell. How, how in the world can that not move us for our heart to be broke and say, Oh, God, what it may cost us. Listen tonight, it's, it's not a sad sob story for me, man. I, I, I don't mind to do this. I'm called to do this. I know I'll take a hit for this. I've already taken hits for this. I'll keep taking hits for this. And I want to say again, it's not a hate message. It's not. It's not. I just don't think people can get saved without the truth. And I don't think you can pet people and pamper people and not give them the truth and them ever come to know Jesus as their Savior. We've got to be truth-filled people. And in order to tell the truth, it hurts. And it costs you something. And people will, will refuse to listen to you or be your friend or hang out with you. Walk in sometime, man. I've done it. Go in and try to sit down in the gym. They don't want you to sit near them. You feel the glances. You feel the looks. Get in line somewhere. Oh, there they are. There they are. Well, we all know what they believe. But I tell you, what it costs you now pales in comparison to what it'll cost in eternity if we don't do it. And I want to stand before my God and say, it mattered to me. It mattered to me. The church mattered to me. These children mattered to me. Those precious children that you gave, my children mattered to me. Their husband and their wife mattered. Their children mattered to me. It mattered more than my comfort. It mattered more than money in the bank account. It mattered more than the home I lived in. It mattered more than how many friends were around me. You mattered, God. You mattered. I mattered so much to you that you came here for me so I could be redeemed. So you mattered. Let's stand tonight. With every head bowed, every eyes closed. I want to ask you something tonight. Does Mary Coffee cut it with you? And let me tell you, it's going to take more than just the preachers in the pulpit. We need people of God who are truth filled. Spirit-filled, God-fearing people. We need people to take a stand. People who are to love Jesus and wet their pillow like Samuel did. The Bible says, I'm sorry that I ever allowed him to be king. And when Samuel heard that, he didn't say, I totally agree. You ought to obliterate him. He went home and all that night he cried. I looked the words up. He literally wept uncontrollably. Can you imagine the weeping and the wailing that he had going on? I just asked tonight, across this house, just letting God move right now. Does it matter? Maybe tonight you just want to step from where you're at. Forget what everybody thinks. Good night. We need interceders. We need men and women of God who will intercede for their family, including I'm talking to me tonight. Man, I need to do a better job praying for my nieces, my nephew, praying for, for that baby. I need to do a better job praying for people I know tonight who are unchurched, who are, who are lost without Christ. I need to pray tonight for my friends people that I dearly love who are caught up in deep sin. Just, just saying, oh God, God help us to be people who will stand on the truth but do it in love. Just coming and interceding on their behalf. You know what Samuel was doing? He was interceding. He loved the people of God. I don't want to see this church go away. I don't want to see our young people turn their back on the things of God. I don't want the 18 to 29 bracket out of this church to leave God. But studies are showing us that nearly half of our children in America 
are leaving. They're leaving the church. They're done with it. God help us. Bible is true and what you said in it is true we know tonight God that if we are to be blessed we've got to obey your command Saul's taught us that you do not wink at disobedience to your commandments God help us as a church to follow you wholly God we pray for our kids tonight we pray for our young people we pray for grandkids tonight we pray for these little ones that filled this stage and filled this choir on Sunday night, God. And they sang to Jesus. And we know that there's a real enemy who's crouched at the door ready to pounce on our babies, pounce on our grandchildren, to tell them that the Bible is not true. God, I pray that you'd do such an amazing work in our homes that we as moms and dads and grandparents would constantly be telling our kids about who you are, that there would not be a generation after who knew not the Lord, but God, we would raise a generation who knows you, who will stand for you, and who will go to the very gate of hell if need be. God, we need warriors in these days. Help us to be warriors. Help us to stand for truth no matter the cost, no matter the bad publicity, no matter how many people walk out of our lives, God. Help us to lovingly but courageously stand on the Word of God. I pray for every teacher in this church. I pray, God, for every parent in this church and every grandparent. They'll teach their kids what the Bible says. God, we'll never be ashamed of what we believe and what we stand for. And may Calvary Road Baptist Church be a light in the dark world. God, never let this light go out on this hill. May we always let our light so shine before men that they'll see our good works and they'll glorify our Father who is in heaven. Lord, tonight we love you. We thank you for this message that you have given that's challenged our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, thanks for being with us in worship today. It is our heart's desire that through the word and through this worship service today, God has spoken to your heart and you desire to serve him and to worship him more than you ever have in your life. You know, if you've been watching today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that is our greatest desire. If we can be a help to you, if we can uh, assist you in any way, please contact us at the information you see on the screen. We also want to thank those of you who watch us regularly. We greatly appreciate your prayer and support. Keep praying for us as we pray for you as we serve the Lord together.